Today I'm speaking to Murta Kaulad, who is the uh, uh, director for the World Food Programme uh, Indonesia. So, welcome. Thank would, you very much. Would you like to share this morning uh, with us um, some of the, the work that the World Food, Pro Food Programme is doing on food security and insecurity in Indonesia, and maybe highlight some of the, the issues that, that you're, you're tackling? Yes, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, the World Food Programme is uh, very much focused on supporting uh, uh, access to diverse foods and uh, therefore to a balanced diet. Uh, a diet that does not focus only on uh, energy starches, uh, meaning only cereals, rice, maize uh, or wheat, uh, but that includes also vitamins, uh, minerals, uh, uh, proteins. and. Uh, one of the concerns that we have is uh, that uh, for various reasons, but a lot due to poverty, uh, people tend to consume mostly cereals and very monotonous diets. It's poverty and often it is also ignorance. We see this trend also in, uh, in uh, higher income levels. Uh, unless people become really very well educated and then they really diversify their diet. And the reason, uh, I mean, this has led, or the reason, it's a, a complicated cause and effect uh, relationship. But it's also that uh, the current supply chains uh, that we have for foods, uh, they are actually very monotonous and very much focused on logistics, on the ease of transport, on minimizing costs, and, and therefore standardizing a lot the products. And we see this with all the processed foods uh, as well as uh, with the fresh foods. Uh, they all come from very standardized production patterns, uh, which uh, of course optimize profits and optimize uh, uh, price and accessibility, but they certainly penalize uh, the availability. And uh, what we see also is a loss in very healthy traditions. Uh, tradition, people that still live in uh, isolated communities, uh, that still have uh, um, the possibility to rely on their knowledge, traditional knowledge, like people living in the forests, uh, actually they have uh, uh, a much better uh, nutrition level among their children uh, than people who live in urban areas and are middle class. Uh, and this is because uh, uh, through their traditional knowledge uh, they can access uh, this incredible wealth and variety of nutrients uh, that are in the forests. Now the challenge uh, is that with the use of uh, land for industrial production, uh, a lot of the forest is being lost. Mm -hmm. And this is causing a loss of this knowledge this is causing also uh, a important poverty levels and dependency uh, by these uh, people who have this knowledge actually on markets and commercial foods. And this induces in them important negative behavior because uh, for them it becomes a matter of survival. They need to chop the wood to sell it to have money to buy the rice that is available in the market. Uh, they don't preserve the forest uh, anymore because the forest is bringing them the, the, the variety of foods, but also of medicines uh, that they need. So this is the focus that the World Food Programme has uh, on the whole issue of uh, nutrition, diversification and, um, and forests. That's very interesting because it resonates very clearly with the research that we do at the Centre of International Forestry Research. And we have found in Africa and in Indonesia uh, a very clear relationship between tree cover and nutrition and independent of, of wealth. So poor people who have access to a diverse environment actually have a better diet and a more nutritious diet. And uh, you've described what we, we call the nutrient transition, you know, the transition for once you have a, uh, a certain amount of income to this processed type um, diet dominated by staples, uh, wheat, rice and whatever, um, which gives the double burden of you know, um, uh, obesity um, and uh, the instant, higher instances of non-communicable diseases. Um, and uh, you mentioned education, and it's interesting because Indonesia is a very, um, is a bit of a ticking time bomb with regard to type 2 diabetes, for example. And here we are in Jakarta, and we're in the CBD, predominantly surrounded by restaurants that are characterized by fast food. Mm -hmm. So much of the middle class have made that transition from that diverse diet into the more Western diets and are suffering accordingly. Do you think that there's a cultural factor in, in that transition as well? 
Uh, well, there is a cultural uh, uh, factor in that the new generations that, uh, that are born and grow up in urban areas, uh, they do not have uh, the knowledge uh, that their forefathers had uh, when they were growing up in, in rural areas. Uh, and uh, they grow dependent on, uh, uh, and, and with a taste also, that relies very, very much on, on the fast food. Uh, there is an issue certainly of knowledge uh, and there is certainly an issue of incomes. Uh, if uh, incomes continue growing, uh, certainly then people become also more sensitive to what is health foods, what is organic foods, uh, uh, diverse foods and so on. Um, but um, there is really uh, in Indonesia also a big threat when I visit communities that are in the more remote part of, uh, of Indonesia it is evident how they have really already resorted to these negative uh, practices which is logging mm -hmm. to cultivate maize. You see many patches uh, in the forest cover that are um, just for production of cereals uh, for, uh, for markets, for the simple purpose of earning incomes. So uh, the challenge is really to make use uh, of uh, the large dimension of the country to really develop more loca local markets, local policies, uh, local engagement. Uh, um, traditional foods do not travel much. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a problem. Uh, certainly research and development uh, to uh, understand better the value of forest products is important. Um, certainly also to understand uh, and improve the supply chains uh, is, is very, very important. So there is a need for a national effort. But I would really say that it's uh, expanding markets at local level, uh, which would really help preserving the traditions. You have to preserve the forest, the biodiversity mm -hmm. diversity at, at the same time as you promote the use of forest foods. So you, you mentioned that, um it alluded to the production by smallholders and uh, work by C4 and FAO have shown that a vast majority of the world's food, or at least a vast proportion, is, is grown by smallholders in diverse cropping systems. And as we see changes in demographics, as farmers get older, their children don't want to come back to the land, we see consolidation of land, which is then often given out as concessions for oil palm, for example. And so we're seeing land being changed from agricultural production to commodity production. What impact does that have on food security and insecurity, and also resilience to climate change, for example? How do people adapt in, with huh. regard to their food systems? Um, there is a need to to think and develop ways to offset uh, the current trend because the current trend is, uh, is really generating very vicious cycles. So we have a short-term solution. You and me may be eating well, um, but I think our grandchildren or grand-grandchildren will have a big problem if we continue behaving the way we are behaving uh, because uh, we deplete the forest cover uh, we create an increased exposure to natural disasters. Uh, um, we uh, do not have alternative systems, uh, and alternatives are always uh, very important, and we create a, a very strong dependence. So also the, the whole issue of the food sovereignty and the food yes. security of countries uh, is a very, very important uh, issue on this. And most importantly, we really lose the knowledge uh, that there is about, uh, and we lose access to a wealth of foods that we don't, we haven't discovered yet. So um, ways uh, that really, uh, while meeting the needs of an urbanized uh, world, uh, but at the same time value and and bring to the right uh, use and respect uh, forest foods would be certainly very enriching, very beneficial and would be part of this uh, uh, change of behavior and change of strategies uh, uh, that the world needs in order to, to be able to ensure that our grandchildren will, will have uh, good quality food and, and the right access to, to the broadest uh, type of foods possible. What do you say to, to those critics who are out there who say that the world actually grows enough food? Um, we have a billion people who are undernourished, a billion people who are obese. 
there's something wrong in our food system somewhere. Where's, where's the solution? I mean, we, coming from the Center for International Forestry Research, we're concerned with natural resources, forests, and their influence on food systems. And so we want to protect them and, and integrate them into our production of food as, as much as possible. But what's gone wrong with our food systems that we have a situation 40 years after the Green Revolution that we still have a billion people undernourished and a pe billion people obese, this inequity, you know, how, can we, how can we address that? It's a very complex uh, issue. No? You have, we have to look at it uh, from, uh, from various angles. Um, I do think that uh, public-private partnerships are important in this because there is an important awareness raising and understanding of a common understanding of the challenges uh, that, is, uh, that is required. Where we are now is just the evolution and the consequence of uh, our economic system. Um, it brings advantages uh, because for those who can, uh, there is certainly, and who live in urban settings, uh, there is certainly now better possibility to, to be better nourished uh, and, and uh, nourish children uh, well than there was uh, 40, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, the sustainability of it is, is a real challenge. Um, it is a system that is full of waste, that is extremely m monotonous, so it really misses opportunities as well. Um, but the, there is a need to recognize the problem, there is a need to study, and, and, and there is a need for willingness uh, to, to change it. Besides also the, the need for not just the economic rationale that well-nourished children turn into uh, strong, intelligent, brighter human beings, uh, but also that it is really uh, morally and ethically a, an obligation for every individual to make sure that other individuals also have uh, proper nutrition, proper education. So uh, it's part really of the overall development goals, uh, not just for uh, one country, I would say, but yeah, for every country. It's a good point, actually. It brings me on to my, my uh, next question about the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, as we think about post-2015, what role forests, landscapes have uh, in terms of defining the future development of the, of the globe, if you like. Um, and one thing that we're, we're, we're thinking about and, and, and trying to influence is, is getting landscapes on, onto the agenda. So instead of agriculture and forestry being siloed out, segregated, as they have traditionally been, a much more integrated approach to, to natural resource management and food production. And basically being cognizant of the value of forests and natural systems to agriculture, the services that, that they provide in terms of pollination services, climate regulation, water, clean water, I mean, has a huge impact on, on nutrition and health of Absolutely. local communities. How feasible do you think that is as a wish list for us as a, as a, a center to influence the sustainable development goals to such a degree that we can get that level of cognizance and recognition of landscapes as a concept, sustainable landscapes as a concept? Well, it's a revolutionary thought, but uh, the world at the moment needs quite a number of revolutions at this, uh, of this type because uh, our systems are unsustainable. We deplete too much of the natural resources and, and the forest is perhaps uh, yeah, together with the oceans uh, the, or the rivers, I mean the, the nature overall, but forests in particular are uh, the soul of the world are really, I mean, how can the world, can you imagine a world without forests? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, no I don't no, know, it will be the moon, visible. can we live on the moon, can we eat well on the moon, can we prosper? Yeah. So certainly there is, I think there is a lot of uh, uh, awareness that is developing in it uh, about this issue. It is uh, still, uh, um, I think, a, a small elite and an intellectual elite that is uh, appreciating these challenges. So uh, there is a need really to, um, to develop more awareness about it, but also really to focus much more resources on research and development and innovation in this area, absolutely. And, that, and that's ultimately where 
the direction that we aspi aspire to go into, we, that our research will generate this groundswell of, of, of thinking that will essentially embrace natural resources as part of our food production systems, and not think of them as a luxury, which has been described to me in certain meetings with, with agricultural colleagues, that you can't have agriculture and forestry, and we firmly believe that you can have the two together in, in, the, in this integrated landscape scale. So I think that's a, that's a very good point. So thanks very much for your, for your time. It was a very interesting discussion, and I really appreciate you uh, sharing the insights from the World Food Programme. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much you. to you. It was very interesting to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much.